Okay, um, well, hi everybody. Uh, this is a panel discussion on something that we're uh, calling big team science. And um, well, uh, all science is uh, collaborative, but uh, big team science takes this to an extreme. Uh, the idea is that uh, you have a very wide collaboration across many, many people who pool together uh, both intellectual resources and uh, perhaps material resources to pull off uh, projects that are much larger than could um, otherwise be pulled off. Um, so collaboration is nothing new in science, but uh, we've noticed that uh, there's been an increasing trend over the past maybe 10 years in um, uh, disciplines such as psychology, primatology, infancy research, and ecology um, to uh, have these big team science projects that are facilitated by um, you know, the internet and uh, communications technologies. So the purpose of the panel discussion is to explore uh, what these collaborations enable, uh, what you can do with these very big collaborations that um, uh, you could not otherwise, um, different ways to structure these collaborations and um, uh, some challenges for these collaborations. And uh, we also want to explore some uh, disciplinary differences or, um, I uh, had taken an interdisciplinary perspective on these topics. Uh, so we're gonna have uh, about an, um, maybe 40, 45 minutes of discussion um, with uh, 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 plenty of time for Q&A afterwards. Um, so I'll uh, introduce the, the panelists or let them introduce themselves. Um, uh, Nick, why don't you give, uh, why don't you kick us off? Sure, uh, happy to. So my name is Nicholas Coles, I am a research scientist at Stanford University, and I'm also the director of the Psychological Science Accelerator. For those um, who haven't heard of our network, uh, the Psychological Science Accelerator is a globally distributed network of laboratories, and um, we pool intellectual and material resources in order to accelerate the accumulation of reliable knowledge in psychology. Our network currently contains a, a little bit over 1,200 researchers from 82 countries. And thus far, I believe we've been responsible for the implementation of some of the largest experiments ever conducted in social and cognitive psychology. Thanks, Nick. Uh, Tim, how about you? Uh, thanks, Patrick. Um, so my name is Tim Parker. I am a professor of ecology at Whitman College in uh, Washington in the United States. And uh, I am currently a co-leader of a, of a many analyst project in ecology and evolutionary biology, where we've recruited uh, hundreds of uh, different people to analyze um, one of two data sets to try to generate some understanding of some of the degree to which uh, analytical choices drive variability in, um, in results in ecology and evolutionary biology. We know there's quite a lot of heterogeneity in results in ecology and evolutionary biology, um, and we're exploring you know, one potential source of that. So hundreds of analysts and actually another uh, couple of hundred um, uh, internal peer reviewers as well. I'm also a, a participant in, uh, in another big team project, uh, Dragnet, which Lauren's gonna talk about. Uh, great, thanks, Tim. Uh, why don't we take it over to Lauren then so that she could tell us about Dragnet. Sure, great. So my name is Lauren. I'm an assistant professor at the University of Missouri, and um, I've been actually a part of big team science as long as I've been in science, it seems like, um, starting out with the Nutrient Network, but which has now transitioned to the Dragnet, um, which is Basically, we're trying to understand how different global change factors like disturbance and nutrient additions influence grasslands. And so we have one system of an experiment that's um, repeated in grasslands all over. And so, um, yeah, we have one experimental setup, data is collected in the same way, um, and then everybody else runs the experiment. Uh, so it's sort of like a collective, right? And then we get the data and, and process it all together. Thanks, Lauren. Um, how about you, Drew? Yeah, hi. So I'm Drew Alchel. I'm a British Academy postdoctoral fellow at the University of Edinburgh Department of Psychology. And I'm one of the me member of the coordinating team for Many Primates. So Many Primates is a collaboration of comparative psychologists and primatologists from around the world. 
Um, our goal is to pool our resources, in particular the different species and groups of primates we work with, uh, in order to conduct high-powered studies, particularly replications uh, that will hopefully answer the big questions uh, about the evolution of primate cognition. Uh, so we've, we're just finishing up our first uh, big project, and we've got two more, two and a half, say, um, that are well underway at the moment. Perfect. And uh, Kylie, how about you? Thanks, Patrick. Um, my name is Kylie Hamlin, and I'm a professor of developmental psychology at the University of British Columbia. Um, I'm also a governing board member for Many Babies. Um, Many Babies kind of stole its name from uh, all the other Many's um, happening in the world. And uh, in 2015, it was just a bunch of infant, um, mostly infant cognition people getting together and thinking that there's lots of questions that the small samples that we're able to get in our own labs just can't answer. Um, some of those being um, straight up replications, you know, doesn't affect exist and others being questions that really just need um, many, 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 many infants more than you could ever get in a single lab to do. So we're currently about 200 laboratories um, in the world and um, we have um, several uh, finished projects as well as about uh, five others and spin-offs of those projects in the pipeline. Thanks, Kylie. So the uh, the first topic that we want to explore is um, uh, what big team science is for, what it enables. Um, so I guess my, my first question for the panelists is um, uh, what's the origin story of your collaboration or organization? And uh, why, why take this approach? Uh, what does it allow you to do that you couldn't otherwise do? Uh, so Nick, why don't you uh, kick us off? Um, sure. So the Psychological Science Accelerator was founded um, August 2017 uh, by a psychologist at Ashland University named Chris Chartier. And uh, it basically started with a blog post where Chris talked a little bit about his vision for bigger and better psychology. And uh, for people like me who had thought a lot about the value of big team science, this was a long overdue call for reform. Um, so a few weeks later, uh, we already had 72, 72 labs that had uh, joined this network that we now call the Psychological Science Accelerator. And I believe it was maybe a month later that we announced our first call for studies and then just immediately started building up the network. And so that was almost a little bit over four years ago now. And um, I became director at the beginning of this year after helping sort of build this into a network that um, is now a little bit over 1,200 researchers. And um, I, I believe that maybe we're one of the, the biggest big team science organizations that I'm aware of in the social sciences right now. Um, we have uh, now 11 studies on our roster, um, two which have been published at Nature Human Behavior um, and many more coming soon. And uh, Patrick, you kind of asked a two-part question about why do big team science, um, but to make sure I don't take up too much time. I'll push that question to the side for a moment. Sure. Um, how about you, Drew? Yeah, so many primates started in, I think, late 2016, early 2017, when a bunch of us were kicking around some similar ideas. Um, and I think it really started with us thinking about the psychological replication crisis and particularly issues of sample size, because in primatology and primate cognition, we have I mean, we have smaller samples even than than uh, psychosocial psychology or developmental psychology used to have. We had, there was a real challenge with this, and so we wanted to understand were what were the problems that were potentially being caused by this, and ultimately what could we do about the fact that if you go to just an individual lab or an individual zoo, there's just not that many individuals, individual primates that you can work with. So how can we, as a community, get around um, this issue? And then a second thing that came along was a realization that the focus in primate cognition is on just a few species, chimpanzees, rhesus monkeys, for example, and there's a vast amount of energy being uh, devoted to those animals, but we're not really getting a very particularly wide or comprehensive picture of cognition across the entire um, clade. So we, in order to actually understand the evolution of primate cognition, we felt like we needed to just try and broaden that out and bring more people in. And so that was, it was these two goals working together that made us want to bring together a bigger organization that could reach out and uh, bring in more people from who wouldn't normally also be involved as much. Perfect. How about you, Lauren? 
Yeah, so our origin story started with um, my PhD advisor and several of his friends. They were all in uh, an, a synthesis working group. And so they were um, tasked with trying to use meta-analysis to understand some of the generalities that in plant community ecology. And they were just finding that, you know, the data and the methods were so different across these studies that they were really frustrated. And they're like, there's gotta be a better way if we're really gonna be able to sort of make these conclusions. And so they were like, well, what if we set up, you know, an experiment to actually test this in the same way everywhere? And so they put out a call on Ecolog. This is for the Nutrient Network, right, by the way. Um, they put out a call on Ecolog and the first year they had 15 people join on and then it's just grown from there to over a hundred sites doing the same experiment that, you know, then you can have all these different, you, once the data is pooled, you can um, answer all these other really interesting questions, um, which has resulted in a lot of work. And so Dragnet, which is this new network that is sort of the Nutrient Network 2.0 that I'm a part of and helping lead is sort of what are we gonna do after 10 years? What's the next big experiment that we wanna do? Can we get new people involved? Can we learn our lessons from the previous version and you know, sort of move forward? So that's, that's where we are. How about you, Tim? Thanks, yeah, it's, I, I was sitting here trying to think about where I wanted to start my, the origin story of our many analyst project. But uh, since Lauren brought in meta-analysis, I'll, I'll go to meta-analysis. Um, in, in, which is really just sort of my origin story in this interest, in, in, you know, an interest in, in this topic is just because, you know, I did some meta-analyses and there's really nothing like meta-analyses to really give you insight into, um, you know, variability um, in outcome and also variability in, in quality and reliability and variability in choices that analysts make and everything else, um, which really got me interested in, in this, in these sort of broader kind of meta-science questions about well, why are the results vary in, in ecology and evolutionary biology? And, and, and a related sort of question, which motivated me as well, which is just, you know, what can we do to get more, more reliable results? Um, anyway, I, I actually don't remember exactly when I started to talk with my collaborators about this, um, doing this many analyst project, but we, I think we started thinking about it, you know, uh, you know four-ish, four or five years ago, um, and then, um, you know, eventually managed to find some data sets that we thought were suitable to, uh, you know, to have, to, to share um, and have a lot of people analyze. And we just, um, when we, we decided to do it as a, as a registered report. So we wrote up a, a proposal, um, you know, a, you know, a methods and a, you know, an introduction and a method section, got it reviewed, got it, um, got it accepted um, at, you know, as a stage one registered report. And then we just started recruiting people and we just used uh, Twitter to, to recruit people and, um, and have, like I said, recruited several hundred people. I don't, even, I don't even know how many people are involved, but you know, on the order of 400 people or so. Um, and, uh, and those folks have now done their analyses and we're just in the process of, of trying, to, trying to get rolling. And I guess just, to maybe answer that second part of your question a little bit, uh, you know, to answer this question that we're trying to answer this research question of well, why do results vary so much among studies in ecology, you know, if, you know, to explore this one potential mechanism, which is the choices that analysts make are different and they contribute heterogeneity to results. You know, one of the primary ways, the only way you can really study that empirically to actually have an idea of how analysts, how different analysts do, you know, answer the same question differently is to give them all the same question and see what they do. Like, it just seems like the, the natural way to explore that empirically, so. Great, and how about you, Kylie? Great, yeah. Um, so, you know, our origin story is um, in 2015, just a bunch of people at a conference chatting about like the possibilities of what we could we could do if we did something like pool resources across many labs. But I would say that like there are three things that we try to do as many babies, which we can only do in this kind of setting. One is just have bigger samples than you could get in any individual lab. Um, and because babies and I presume primates um, are the kinds of subjects that you can't get a lot of trials out of, um, what you can do in an individual lab is like sort of double limited, right? You have fewer subjects and you get fewer trials out of them. And so 
things like sort of looking at psychophysical curves and all kinds of stuff you might want to do. You just really can't do unless you have tons and tons of subjects pooled together. Um, the second is, of course, basic replication, like does this or that famous effect in the literature replicate or doesn't it? Um, and one thing that we do a lot as many babies is we try actually not to, to necessarily do direct replications of published things. Rather, we try to sort of do, in some ways, adversarial collaborations where the group comes up with the best way to test a hypothesis. So, you know, there's maybe 10 papers in the literature about something about infant cognition, five of which suggest they can do it and five of which suggest they can't or something like that. And the idea is that before we start the study, people from both sides of the theoretical divide agree <laughs> that, you know, if we do this study and the results come out like that, then, you know, yes, babies can do it. And if the results come out in this other way, then we all agree, no, they can't. Um, as opposed to this sort of like, I publish a paper saying yes, you publish a paper saying either no or saying like, I interpret your data differently than you interpret it. We sort of get the interpretation stage done with first. Um, so yeah, those are sort of our three goals. Perfect. Uh, Nick, I see that you want to say something more. Yeah. Um, so this is my first time hearing some of the other's origin stories, and it's really fascinating. And it, it just a thought popped into my head that there seems to be a common thread that's uniting all of us today. And I, I think that what we're seeing is that the biggest issues that scientists face require a lot of resources, a lot of perspectives, um, and many minds. And um, just as we saw that big team science sort of has helped physicists make great leaps and um, uh, and uh, like helped us map the human genome, uh, we're seeing that that sort of big team science model uh, can be usefully applied to other disciplines as well. And it seems like one of the common threads in our stories is that at some point we came to this realization that our topic of interest is really complex and that we've been trying to study something that's complex, uh, but have done so with these financial and logistical constraints that sort of forced us to do this um, with very small operations. Um, but it seems like with all of us, we're, we're learning perhaps from like the meta science movement that uh, our studies can yield different results depending on experimental designs and different perspectives and different measurements and different um, cultures and areas that we sample. Um, and different data analysis strategies. And I think this is all pointing to that idea that the reality that we're trying to understand is extremely complicated, far too complicated to be understood through small operations. Um, and I think what's uniting us is this realization that big team science networks, like the ones that we're creating, um, give us uh, those pooled intellectual and uh, material resources necessary to try to understand that complex reality. Yeah, and I, I wanted to ask a follow-up question for you all uh, that relates to those themes. So uh, hypothetically for many of these projects, you could um, have many labs uh, run related projects and then synthesize them later through meta-analysis or some other quantitative synthesis, hypothetically. Um, however, you know, all of these projects, uh, organizations uh, work on unified protocols and actually have a collaborative element. So um, I wonder if you all could speak to what you think for your project is gained from that specific collaborative element. Maybe uh, uh, Drew, can you kick us off? Okay, yeah, sure. Um, yeah, I mean, in the, in the animal cognition literature, there's, I mean, quite a bit of debate, just like there is in most literatures about is something a direct replication is a conceptual replication did they do it right did they do it wrong um i mean in our case it was really important to figure things out beforehand and come up with a fairly unified protocol because it turned out that we like you have to come up with i'll, I'll take our first study as an example which is a short-term memory task where you have some cups on a board and you move you hide a treat and you move the cups around a little bit it's actually very simple you just have to get the monkeys to remember how long like for 30 seconds or 60 seconds to see if they remember where the cup was very simple task but it turns out um you have to have different kinds of 
board sizes, depending on the size of the animal to make sure that like the visual field is being represented the same way with all these different size animals. And these are the kinds of things we never would have, if we didn't sit down in advance and free register and try and figure this out all in advance, we would be hitting, we'd be hitting so many issues down the lines. We tried to implement this at every individual site. So instead we tried as best we could to have every site show us um, their implementation in advance. Uh, and then the committee, a bunch of us would look over and say, okay, yeah, that looks fine. Or if they had issues, we'd always respond as quickly as we could saying, hey, don't worry about this. This is okay. We'll make note of this. And even when we did this, issues would still come up down the line a little bit. But the fact that we did as much as we could in advance made a huge difference. It would have been basically impossible if we didn't make do all this planning and centralize it in advance. Thanks. Um, how about you, Lauren? Yeah, I, so I think one thing that's really great about this big team science, right, that we found is that it's just really built on a group of amazing people. And so we have so many, right, when you're writing a paper, you have 30, 40, 50 of the best minds in the field to review your paper and make sure it's really good. And that can be overwhelming, of course, but in the end, I think it really pushes the science forward in ways that we wouldn't have guessed. Um, and especially we have a protocol for add on experiments. So if someone has an idea, right? That wasn't the initial idea. They can propose that other people can all collect that same data, pool that work on a new project. And so the questions have also really gone in directions that the original, um, you know, idea of folks, the original people who set it up never had anticipated and right. Like that's why I'm involved is because we get to do cool stuff. And so I really love the fact that it's just been such a great group of people to work with. And that's been super important sort of as we're transitioning, right? So now we're getting to almost two generations of, of, of scientists. So like, right, like I, my advisor student, but then now I'm bringing students into the network. And so we're really, you know, expanding pretty fast. And so what we found is that the, what's really important about it is the community. So people want to use our data. There's plenty of published data out there now from the network and people want to use it, uh, but it's hard to convince them to sort of fit into the framework sometimes because they don't sort of, you know, they don't participate in the meetings, they don't contribute the data, right? So there's a clear difference that we're seeing between just using the data that's available versus actually contributing and being a part of this intellectual community. So that's what I love the most about it. Yeah, thanks for that. Um, how about you, Nick? Yeah, you raise this really interesting question of like, well, why don't we all just do science by ourselves and then we'll all combine it later. Um, but what I really liked about your origin story, Warren, is that your, your group was built off of just knowledge of how frustrating that process can actually be. And so when you're trying to synthesize the literature through something like meta-analysis or a systematic review, the, you, know, the, you often learn that the people have just done things too differently. And it's so different in so many different ways that it's not even clear if it makes sense to combine it all into a single analysis or to a single conclusion. And so I think, Lauren, what I really liked about your origin story was like part of what you all wanted to do was like drive towards standardization a little bit so that things were actually a little bit more comparable. Um, I would say another frustrating aspect of trying to come in after the fact and synthesize everyone's work is that. Um, you have to try to find it first. That's very time consuming. Um, but people aren't very good at describing what they did in their studies. Um, and oftentimes, you, you know, sometimes you'll run across an author that you, you use one of their studies in your meta-analysis and they tell you all these details about their study that you had no idea about. And like, oh yeah, we measured X, Y, and Z. And you say, I would have loved to have X, Y, and Z in my meta-analysis, but I never knew you had it. Um, and uh, there's just so many limitations of the tools that we have to synthesize uh, the literature after the fact. Um, it just seems so much more powerful to coordinate in the first place as opposed to try to clean up the mess afterwards. Yeah, uh, thanks for that. Um, so I, I wanted to pick up on another issue that Kylie uh, hinted at, which is when you're managing these big projects, uh, these big collaborations, um, you, um, you're in control of a ton of resources or the collaboration is in control of a ton of resources. So what you choose to deploy those resources on is extremely consequential. Um, so I wanted to know, um, how do your respective collaborations make that decision? Or is there a, a structured process for that? 
Um, maybe we could start with Kylie since you already hinted at what Many Babies does. Sure. So um, the, the thing that we did first was we had um, the community nominate potential um, topics or effects in the literature um, that people would like to see as subject to a large scale replication. Um, and then vo we voted on the top ones. Um, the project we chose to do first was actually a phenomenon that pretty much everyone thinks exists, um, exists. And that was a sort of intentional decision because we wanted to just like have a proof of concept. Can we actually coordinate across, um, at that time it was 60 um, labs doing behavioral, you know, lab-based research. Um, and after that proof of concept, we went into much more, um, controversial phenomena to see if we could replicate those um, for future things that for, perhaps were not voted on in the initial round um, we have a formal submission process where people can submit like a proposal um, to um, say you know i would like to make this a many babies project um, where they need to um, describe things like, why is this something that the field would think is worthy of, of a ton of resources? Um, why can't it be done in an individual lab kind of situation? Um, you know, who's gonna lead the project? So some, some um, sort of practicalities of how this might work, et cetera. And then our governing board reviews those submissions um, and we've, had you know a few cases where we've gone back to people to ask um, them to do more to justify the sort of need for this project, um, and other cases where it's been clear to everyone, and you know those have been approved right away. Yeah, thanks for that. Um, how about you, Drew? Yeah, so we're basically kind of on our our first round of ideas. We've done a similar thing with uh, with what many, many babies has done, as Kylie said, where we basically at, in 2018 at the International Primatological Society Congress, we all sat down in a special meeting and kind of brainstormed ideas really quickly and wrote them all down. Uh, and then later we voted kind of did a short form voting um, rather we had we had our long list and we narrowed that down to a, a smaller group of ideas. And then we had people volunteer uh, to basically write little outlines kind of an outline and case combination uh, backing up and supporting and presenting each of the, the, the short list ideas. And then we voted it again. Um, and the first two of those are now going ahead uh, as projects two and three. And the next one, I'm not sure if we're gonna take another call for ideas for the next, uh, for the next round or if we're gonna go back to our, to our pool. Great, thanks for that. Um... How about you, Nick? Um, so I, I think our structure is somewhat similar to many babies in the sense that when the network, uh, when, when it appears that we have the resources to do more work, we open usually a call and allow anyone to submit. And um, part of our process then is that uh, we have an internal review team that reviews uh, proposals for things like feasibility, scientific merit, um, and uh, potential interest to the network. And then at some point we get feedback from the rest of the network to see uh, just how interested they are, because it seems like all of our organizations rely pretty heavily on volunteer labor. And so if your network's not excited about the project, it's, it's dead on arrival. So that's been the traditional way that we've done things. Although um, we've definitely had interesting conversations with funders about um, doing themed calls um, where we ask people to submit proposals on a very specific topic. So that's something that is interesting that I think will be the future of this psychological science accelerator, but it hasn't been the past. Great. So, so yeah, I think, on. oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> so I think for us, um, 
Right, I was interpreting this slightly differently. So our intellectual resources, anyone can propose a project, uh, propose a paper, anyone can do that. that, that's up to anyone. So that is very driven by the individual researcher. Um, where our resources are best spent, I think like actual financial resources is having a data manager or a postdoc to help us coordinate all the data, get the data from all the sites and make sure it's you know in a form that's usable and the same across every, so we can all use it across all sites. So that's our number one, um, use of funds. And it's, you know, of course, tricky to find money for a person like that, but it's critical. And I think our, the second way that we use resources is to host in-person meetings where we can spend time brainstorming, getting to know each other, getting to know the ideas. And this is especially helpful for inclusion, right? Getting to know people from other countries that maybe you didn't know before. Um, and so, yeah, that's how we spend our resources. And to, to follow up briefly, Lauren, so when you're, when you're choosing uh, what scientific topics to, uh, to investigate. Do you have a process for that as well? So ours sounds a bit different from everybody else's, uh, but right, so we, it was structured, the experiment was structured on, on some basic questions um, that, you know, were sort of built off this meta-analysis working group. And then at that point, really anyone can propose a question with the data. Um, and we do have to say, you know, why it's important and write an abstract and say what data we're gonna use and submit that to the, the group. But it's really open. Questions are totally available to anyone who wants to do them. And we have in fact, way more questions than we ever have time to actually write papers to answer them. And so we've, yeah, that's how we do it. Yeah, thanks. And uh, how about you, Tim? Um I actually want to ask, I want to ask Lauren a quick follow up question before I say yeah, go for but, it. So yeah, so Lauren, um, uh, how did what, what was the decision making process behind um, growing Dragnet in its form out of out of Nutnet? Like how did that? Because there's obviously were a whole lot of decisions made about the structure of that experiment. How did how is how are those choices made? Yeah, that was super democratic. So we had a meeting where we all sat down, everyone there, grad students, postdocs, faculty, to write down what we thought might be the interesting next questions that we could ask. And right, there, there are certain parameters in which that we can do this. It has to be really cheap and it has to you know, be able to be replicated. But it, that was a democratic process. So we wrote down tons of questions that we thought would be interesting for the next set of infrastructure. Um, and then there were really several themes that came up and in the end only you know, this one was what just seemed most possible at the most places and the most types of grasslands across the world. Yeah, uh, um, and do you oh, go ahead, Tim? Oh, well, I just, I, I, I now, I, I mean, I'm not actually sure now what I want to say because I've, I've, <laughs> I want to respond to all sorts of things that I've heard, but um, I do want to, I want to give a, another little bit of perspective on. Dragnet. I mean, I'm a contributor to Dragnet, but I haven't taken part in the in any of the the processes. Um, but just sort of as you know, as a contributor, um, you know, I'm a contributor to to Dragnet because um, you know I came at this. I'm actually a behavioral ecologist. I'm not a plant ecologist, although I now um, um, dabble pretty seriously in plant ecology. But I came to Dragnet mostly because um, I was really excited about this idea of distributed experiments with standardized methods and generating generality. Like, you know, I teach ecology. I spend a lot of time, uh, I spend a lot of time, you know, wondering what the heck I should teach my students and what we really know about ecology and, you know, and how do, I, how do we generate, you know, how do we generate really good information? And like other people have said, you know, about meta-analysis, there's a tremendous amount of uncertainty. Often, you know, the methods are so heterogeneous that it's hard to know whether things are whether you're comparing apples to apples at all. Um, and so it's just the, the I'm just super attracted to the, to the method of Dragnet, the distributed experiment where, you know, in the single, uh, the single biome grasslands all around the world, people are doing the same things. And we're getting these data sets that are allowing people to answer these questions about generality that I think are really challenging for ecologists uh, to answer in general. Like I think, I think ecologists really struggled with these questions, and I'm just excited to be contributing to something that even if I never, you know, lead a paper, or even if I'm never even an author on any of these papers, I'm just excited about, um, you know, contributing to something that I feel like is is really generating scientific generality, which I think often in the, you know, with the many individual papers that I've written that have just come out of my own work and my students' work, like I don't know. 
a lot of that stuff, I don't know how general it is. So um, anyway, I, I'll just, I have other things I want to say, but I'll, I just could keep talking. So I'm just going to be quiet. So uh, it's good that we're uh, already stimulating a lot of thought. Um, before I move on to the next question, uh, just a notice to a note to the audience. Um, if you have questions that you want us to handle during the Q&A section, uh, please do ask them in the Q&A box. We'll just let them build up and um, towards the um, latter part of the session, um, we'll start choosing uh, questions to ask to the panel. Uh, so for the next question, um, you know, we've heard from uh, the various panelists that some of these, uh, some of these collaborations have uh, perhaps hundreds of people involved. Um, and that's a, that's a big task to coordinate all those people and to figure out who does what. So uh, what methods do you use to determine what people's roles are and um, to avoid things like diffusion of responsibility? We can um, maybe start with Nick. It's interesting, Patrick, because there was diffusion of responsibility right there. Um, and you employed one of our strategies, uh, which you know, I think is to just clearly identify um, what people's roles are. Um, so so one, of, one of our strategies is we've been over time developing more and more explicit collaboration agreements um, that sort of state what it is that we want everyone to do um, and what the expectations are as far as timeline is concerned and the actual contribution. Um, this often does involve uh, a little bit of compartmentalization of tasks, um, which I saw was an audience question. Uh, and uh, so, you know, usually what we'll do is we'll, we will identify a specific person who will, for instance, be in charge of ensuring that the data management um, protocols meet sort of our expectations. Um, and so in the psychological science accelerator, we have a rule uh, where you cannot have a non-centralized data collection approach because it uh, we've, I, I think that many big team science organizations have hit a point where they try to merge 200 data sets and realize everyone named their variables differently um, and formatted their data sets in, uh, differently. And so we have data and methods people who think a lot about data, uh, data storage and advise the teams on how to do that and help them uh, format their data collection approach. Um, we have people who serve solely as ethics um, coordinators who help get IRB approval at various sites. We also have people who serve as dedicated project managers to sort of track the progress of the study and make sure that it's on track, coordinate with various individuals. Um, and so I think for, for us, the key has been finding people who will fill those roles and making sure that the, their role is very clearly defined and, um, and that expectations are clear. Thanks for that, Nick. Um, how about you, Kylie? Sure. Um, so one thing for us is that we seem, although we feel that we want everything to be sort of um, uh, distributed sort of across the group without a lot of um, hierarchy, in fact, we have a, a fairly hierarchical structure that ends up emerging for each project. So we have a governing board who kind of um, oversee everything and indeed um, at the end of the day, if anyone, you know, below them in the hierarchy um, doesn't do their job, we have to do it, um, is how it ends up turning out. But then each project um, needs to identify a lead team, person or group before they are, you know, permitted to start that is sort of responsible for each individual project. And that lead team on the project is supposed to create sub teams on each project for things like data management, you know, stimulus creation, uh, writing, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so it ends up being that we hope that before each thing happens that everyone is pretty clear on what their role is as Nick um, mentioned. That said, it can be very difficult when you see that like one person is really, or a few people are really doing everything um, because some people haven't been, you know, said they could help and then something happened. And of course, um, that's pretty common. Um, and we just hope that other people can step in, et cetera. But, um, it, you know, it's, it's risky. It's hard to, to ensure that the work is distributed and doesn't fall on, you know, some poor postdocs, uh, 
desk and and yeah. sort of ends up being the only thing they do. So I think I think that's a, a serious challenge to these kinds of um, collaborations and ones that like you can do a lot in the in the on the front end to identify roles and hopefully that will work. And yet, still, it sometimes doesn't work that well. <laughs> How about you, Lauren? Yeah, so I, you know, again, the number one important thing is having a data manager because that that's really someone's only job, especially now that things have really grown so much. And, and we have two networks of data, Nutrient Network and Drag, uh, Dragnet. So having that data manager is key. And then there's, as many people have mentioned, multiple committees that sort of oversee things like authorship committee, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, for the first good 10 to 15 years, things have been going pretty well, although a lot of responsibility does end up sort of falling on the, the sort of heads of the people who end up getting the most grants and they're mostly for coordination. Um, but we've mostly followed the kindergarten rules actually for most of our time, right? Play nice. Um, anything you learned in kindergarten, right? Those are our rules and they tend to work pretty well. Um, but I will say that now, you know, at, again, as we're growing, we have also started to realize that we might need a little more structure than, you know, ecologists really don't like that. We really don't want to have that hierarchy. We really don't want to do that kind of thing. But I think it is a bit necessary to keep things functioning pretty well. Um, and it can still be a kind hierarchy. It doesn't have to be a, a mean one. But um, yeah, so we're finding that as we grow and sort of develop into new projects, it's definitely necessary. Thanks for that. Um, how about you, Drew? Yeah, so many primates, we follow kind of two, two principles um, in terms of how we distribute the work and get things done. I mean, we have, we want to be flat, though we have kind of some necessary hierarchical goal structures, um, much like with many babies. We have a coordinating team for every project, and the coordinating team necessarily does have to ask people to do things sometimes. Um, but in general, it's been, it's been pretty flat. flat so far and every, everything is just volunteered and labor is all just people sign up for different tasks. And the other thing that we just have to, we have to be aware of and kind of have to accommodate is, is whatever people need to do at their sites to get ethics approval or to have a longer timeline or a shorter timeline or whatever they need to do at their, at their zoo or their lab or their sanctuary, we kind of have to be accepting of that. So it means we have to have a certain kind of flexibility um, and a certain kind of openness um, to how people want to do that work. And we can't ask too much of them because we are asking, we're asking for their time, we're asking for the zoo's time or their facility's time. And Tim, what about you? Yeah, well, so the Mini Analyst Project is obviously, I think it's, it's sort of, it's, in some ways, it's kind of the odd one out from the other projects that we're discussing here and that we're, you know, we're a relatively small team of people who decided to recruit a lot of other scientists to do analyses, but the others, to some extent or another, those other scientists are our study subjects. Um, they're they're, they're uh, our collaborators in some way. They're, all those people are gonna be co-authors on this paper. I suspect we're gonna have, it'll be the ecology and evolutionary biology. Uh, we'll probably hold the record for number of authors for ecology and evolutionary biology paper. Um, but uh, but you know really there's a there's a small team of us who's running the project, and so I mean we have similar I mean there's similar issues that people have already brought up, which is you know how do, how does this workload get distributed? I mean we're all none of us are um, it's none of our primary research you know it's a side project for everyone involved, um, and we don't have we don't have another issue that came up some time ago was resources. We don't have any dedicated resources for this project. We're running it entirely um, on a shoestring. Uh, we actually have a situation where, where right now some of the some of the really key um, data management is being done by a graduate student um, who is you know that graduate student is really excited about the project, and I think it's going to be you know it's great that that graduate student is you know getting this experience, et cetera. But you know. Um, that you know, we didn't we didn't set out to uh, when we designed this project. We didn't think, oh, we're going to really end up you know burdening this one person with all these with all these you know uh, you know data management tasks. But that's just sort of how it's how it's evolved. And anyway, I think that maybe the the, the take home lesson is just that there's a there's a these projects are really, really time consuming and, um, and they're, they're difficult and they're always probably like every project, it's always more difficult than you think it was going to be. 
Um, you, you know, this is certainly more difficult than even our most pessimistic estimate of how difficult it would be. I still find it rewarding, but um, but you know, resources are resources are resources are limiting. You know, and when you're trying to do a project like this on a shoestring, you know. I don't want to say the lesson is you shouldn't try to do it, but it's just it's going to be hard and it's and it's going to put stress on people. And I, you know, I don't know what to say about that in terms of, you know, what the lesson is necessarily, but it's a challenge. So I, I want to follow up on um, the the play nice rule and, and all, this maybe also relates to the issue that sometimes these projects are very stressful. Um, so uh, what what do you guys have any procedures for what happens if someone doesn't want to play nice or uh, another direction you could take this is um, uh, how do you in general handle disagreements that occur during uh, between team members so um, maybe we could uh, start with uh, with drew this time um well i was just chatting we don't really we haven't really had so many issues of disagreements between people there's different People sometimes have different competing priorities, which can lead to some issues. But those are usually those are usually issues that don't really have to do with people's personal opinions on the research or anything like that. It's usually about um, people's funding or ethical bodies. Um, so, like the like the kind of the biggest issue we've had to deal with is um, people from sanctuaries working with people who have worked in labs. And now we have kind of a general understanding that uh, animals and people from uh, labs who do invasive research, as long as the animals do not have invasive research done on them, they can take part uh, in theory. But it's a that's kind of the most juggling we have to do. And again, that's not really a disagreement among the people. It's it's a disagreement kind of over all of our heads. Thanks. Um, how about you, Lauren? Yeah, so early on, there was a lot of concern about cheaters, right? Would, would we have a lot of cheaters? How is that going to work? And there's, even to this day, still shockingly very few, and we really don't have that many problems. I think sort of, um, right, Drew, as you said, there's a lot of issues with competing needs and interests, and I think that's where we run into the most trouble. The needs of postdocs are different from that of students, from that of faculty and research scientists, et cetera. And so I think that's where we start to run into some trouble, but again, it's mostly worked out by long conversations and a lot of communication with each other, but it tends to get worked out. And I think also where we're running into some trouble again as we're growing is that there's different interests and expectations of the network, you know, in the culture of being contributing to the data, being a part of it versus just wanting to use the data and, and join in that way. And so I think there's some differences where that can lead to some frustration because people don't want to get opinions from 50 authors, right? They're like, why can't you just like what I'm doing? And I understand that it's a lot to deal with, but your paper's always better. Your work is always better if you work with the really thoughtful folks in the group. So we generally do pretty good. Thanks for that. Uh, what about you, Kylie? Yeah, so one thing that we do is that before labs start data collection, there's a number of sort of hoops that we ask them to jump through. Um, including sort of reading a bunch of documentation and agreeing to our sort of code of conduct and principles that we um, have specified on our um, website, you know, commitments to openness, um, from commitments to openness to, uh, you know, promises to treat everyone with respect and, and that kind of thing. So because I think we front load this sort of like, no, no, you really need to behave yourself. <laughs> and like, this is a um, friendly collaborative thing. Um, we haven't had a lot of problems. Where we have had problems is I think, you know, some people who have traditionally had more status in the field, um, sort of not noticing what's been going on for a while, not like participating in meetings and things like that and sort of decision-making happening. And then at some point wanting to jump back in and sort of say, no, no, I, I don't agree with that decision making that happened. But the, but they didn't participate in the decision making and sort of how do we, yeah, how do we uh, be respectful to everyone while also pointing out that like we've all been doing this for a while, <laughs> and uh, yeah, so um, that is probably the only thing where we've had real conflict and by real conflict I mean like some some people uncomfortable um, but generally speaking like Lauren I think you know it's gone pretty well 
Thanks. Uh, what about you, Nick? I think the, the sorts of conflict that we've experienced in the Psychological Science Accelerator is pretty similar. Um, but I think one thing that has made it hit a bit different for us is that some of our collaborations have had over 500 collaborators on it. And so I think we at first really tried to operate on this consensus model and say like, okay, let's all, uh, I like the preschool metaphor, like let's all like get in a circle and talk about our feelings and figure it out. Um, but as we grew in size and grew in a number of co-authors, um, you get to a point where you realize it's going to take a year for these people to resolve their disagreements totally. Um, and in the meantime, we've done the field somewhat of a disservice as we sat on you know, a lot of really interesting and potentially impactful findings because Patrick and I are arguing about whether the standardized effect sizes or not. Um, that is a real argument that Patrick and I have had, and it's still unresolved after, after many years. Um, and so one, one interesting model that we've um, tried in uh, a study that wasn't formally conducted by the network, but is sort of affiliated, is we've tried a consensus-based model where uh, the person who's sort of writing up the, the discussion and conclusion section is listening to these conversations and all the feedback and trying to write um, a paper that represents the majority view, um, but then allow collaborators to upload dissenting opinions that are linked to as supplemental materials. And I think that as big team science becomes bigger team science, this might be a model that we um, consider um, you know, with the goal of making science move forward as quickly as possible. And I'm right about standardized effect sizes, Nick. Um, I, I wanted to, uh, to follow up on an issue that Kylie brought up though um, about uh, status. I thought that was a really good point. Um, so I've noticed that many of these big team science initiatives are um, idealistic in the sense that they're trying to uh, maybe disrupt um, existing power structures or do things a little bit differently from the norm. Um, so uh, my question to the panel is, um, do you, uh, uh, have you noticed these same power dynamics uh, popping up in, in your respective collaborations uh, and or do you have any procedures in place to prevent those uh, power dynamics? And um, maybe we could start with, uh, with Kylie since uh, you brought up the issue and uh, probably have something to say about it. <laughs> so my sense is that, um the the people who started our group and and i assume that this is true in many of these groups are are ones who are you know potentially somewhat as much as we've benefited from power dynamics i guess are also a bit skeptical of them and sort of are thinking that this larger less hierarchical system where things are more distributed is better and will make better science so i think we kind of start with that moderate bent in our in our the way we see things. Um, however, that doesn't mean that we're not trying to interact with people who are, you know, are more much more senior, more um, uh, in the traditional sort of status hierarchies of, of psychology in our, in our case. And so we if we find that we can't even convince like half the field, or if half the field's ignoring us, we haven't done a good job. <laughs> um, so we really do need to try to um, work with both sides, I guess, sides, if, if you can say it's, it's different sides. Um, so one of the things we've done in that way is really um, just repeatedly invited the people who might not initially um, feel positive about what we're doing to join us and sort of just so that they can see that, you know, we're being reasonable and um, and hope that they will participate from the beginning and then and sign on to the eventual um, product. And that has not always worked. As I mentioned, there was a case where someone wanted to sort of come in three quarters of the way through. Um, and in those situations, we've discussed like how, what are we gonna do? <laughs> um, there's this super senior person who, um, who is getting involved now. Um, and yeah, but, but I think, you know, it can't possibly work if we went without 
the high, you know, and ignored the opinions of the high status individuals, given we're all existing in a world in which those individuals have their status potentially for a reason, but we also want to do better and more distributed things now. And so we're just, we just try to, to do both, I guess. <laughs> Thanks for that. Um, Drew, how about you? So I, I think, I think many primates has found a few conditions that really help us um, kind of avoid too much controversy in the research that we do. Um, I mean, firstly, the kind of the kind of general experiments that we're doing, they're not very like controversial. They tend to be kind of on the descriptive side because what we're, what we're looking at is in many cases, a, a bunch of species that have never been tested on something as basic as working, simple working memory, short-term working memory, or the ability to inhibit um, taking some food. Common, common uh, tasks that you'll see done you know, in 40, 50 papers with capuchins, but most species have never been looked at. So there's not a lot of reason for people to get too invested in how any particular species does. And then the other thing about our structure is that we, we work mostly on Slack and we work mostly um, in with volunteer groups. And so if someone wants to be involved, they have to get involved, they have to get on the Slack, they have to get on the Google Docs and they have to actually get involved if they want to cause some trouble. And we haven't had anyone really cause trouble. And I think that's maybe that's the thing about senior people is they don't really have the time or the inclination to go be looking at Slack four or five times a day in order to keep up with the discussion, whereas um, people who are younger and don't have as much invested are much more willing to just you know, put in the effort um, and aren't really particularly attached to any, any particular theory. Yeah, thanks for that, Drew. Um, so I, I'm going to move on to the next question. Um, we've already talked a bit about, um, or I've, some of you have talked a bit about challenges in your respective collaborations or organizations. Um, so I, I guess I'll ask a, sort of an open-ended question about this. What would you say are the, the biggest challenges for your respective collaborations? And I'd like to hear from each of you on this. Um, so uh, maybe we could start with Tim. Uh, yeah, that's a really good question. I mean, I think I touched on this, some of these challenges already, but I mean, I think, you know, at different stages, it seemed like the challenges um, differed. Um, you know, well, let's see. So at the, I guess right now, the biggest challenge is one that I've already mentioned uh, or alluded to anyway, and that is um, data management. We, are, we're, we have data from, you know, hundreds of research teams being submitted. And, um, and even though, you know, we tried to, and we tried to, you know, restrict how people submitted data and tried to give people really specific instructions. We got for for all sorts of reasons, um, a lot of which are totally valid. You know, we got we got a lot of results in a lot of different forms, and just the challenge of trying to trying to pull all these data from these many disparate sources, as, as somebody already mentioned, you know, that can be really challenging, and it's challenging for us right now, and we're spending a lot of time on it. Um, you know, and other challenges I've all already mentioned too are you know. Um, a lack of resources, the fact that this is nobody's sort of front burner project for the most part, um, and the fact that you know we're just relying, you know, we have a um, we have you know a bunch of collaborators who are, you know, all doing their best to to contribute to this, but you know, oftentimes you know, like I'm really busy and I don't have time for the next several weeks, and one of my other collaborators wants something from me, and then like then I've got time and and you know they don't have time, et cetera, just um, those sorts of things. Um, I think I'll just, I'll leave it at that for now. I mean, there are various other challenges, but I'm curious to hear from other people. Sounds good. Um, how about you, Nick? I suspect that um, our challenges have been quite similar. And I know we've touched upon a few of them so far, you know, funding, incentivizing um, the labor, ensuring honest, accurate reporting, personnel disagreement. One that I think we, we haven't talked about as much so far as infrastructure issues. And this has been a real big challenge for the Psychological Science Accelerator. Um, the tools that researchers have at their disposal are not really meant and designed with these really massive collaborations in mind. And so we find that we're often trying to break a tool to make it work for our purposes or developing brand new tools um, so that they can be sort of retrofitted um, or rather than retrofitted, created for our specific use. Um, but every step of the way, we learn that we're just navigating um, an infrastructure that's not ready, that hasn't been built for big team science. And um, so one example that I'm sure you all have experienced at some point already is 
uploading um, authorship information to a manuscript portal. Uh, we have 500 authors on some of our studies and you get to the manuscript portal and you're like, oh, okay, I can just upload a CSV maybe. No, 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 no. Manually uploading 500 people's information takes several days and it's honestly like the worst part of the project in my opinion. Um, and then of course you submit the paper and someone says, oh, but I changed institutions. Um, so you go back into Manuscript Central to change it and then Manuscript Central crashes and you have to start all over again. So that's just one of the examples of sort of the infrastructure issues um, but also one that we've seen a lot in our network is just having the infrastructure necessary for managing a database of members and knowing what they've done and when they've done it and what they're interested in doing and what their areas of expertise are. Um, you know, businesses and corporations have dedicated departments for that, um, whereas we have maybe a postdoc who like kind of is into developing websites, um, sort of like working with a researcher to try to do it. Um, and so, uh, I think infrastructure is one of the big issues that we haven't tapped on yet. Lauren? Yeah, and I guess what I would add, because um, I do agree with all of the things mentioned, um, is sort of a misunderstanding of, of what this work really is. I think that people in the network see the value of them and really understand how we can make this amazing inference by working in this way. And like, to we do better science together than we do if we compete, which is by, I guess that's also probably a kindergarten rule, but, um, I find it can be challenging to explain this work to people, right? Like, I feel like it's hard enough to justify a paper with like 50 to 100 authors. I don't even know how you deal with this with 500. So, you know, people, it's very common to hear that. Well, how, what could you have possibly done, you know, if you're like one of 50 authors, one of 100 authors? And it's like, well, we did a lot, right? And, and it, so I think the, the misunderstanding of how much work it really takes and sort of the credit that you get for that is there's no way to like write that down on your CV, right? Like I spent hundreds of hours talking to people about, you know, so their research projects don't overlap and so they can each have their own piece and feel confident in their work. Like that's really hard to describe that. And so that's where I think is another piece. How about you, Drew? Yeah, so the issues of like infrastructure and long-term sustainability certainly loom large for us. Um, uh, I guess rather than talk about that again, I'll um, I'll, hide, I'll highlight something that's quite a quite a big thing for us, which is the fact that most of our animals come from places in what we call range nations, and most of our researchers are in places in like the United States and Europe and Australia, which are places that don't have primates. Um, so, but the primates are in places like South America and Asia and Africa, and so it's a big issue and concern for us that we want to be. Kind of expanding and working with people and the primates in those areas and that's something we're just trying to get started on now but i mean that's a big that's a big um project for us um and it's also big it's a big challenge because that probably requires more funding on our part because we need to be able to provide incentives um for people across the world to be able to participate if we want to if we want to keep this going great and how about you kylie yeah um what Drew just mentioned is something that um, I was going to touch on, but the, you know, I think in some ways being able to have enough extra resources in your lab or whatever to dedicate some amount of them to big team science, um, as opposed to just things where your first author or your student is first author or whatever, um, sort of is a little bit like it might be the richest labs in the world or the, or the most well-resourced labs in the world able to do it. And um, we have tried and tried and tried, but have had a really hard time getting funding to help other labs who are less well-resourced participate. And this means you know, a lot of things, but one of the things that you might think would be a benefit to big team science is better representation around the world. And I think in some ways that it is, um, but that better representation is still going to be heavily skewed toward, you know, weird people. Um, and that is a, something we talk about a lot. I mean, we talk about how our governing board is not diverse. Our labs are not particularly diverse. Um, and even when we are able to recruit labs in other places that are more diverse, um, how do we, um, give those other people um, more power in, in the relationships um, and decision-making power and things like that. So this is a challenge that we have far from 
um, done very well to overcome. Um, but it's just, I think, one of another thing that a lack of funding um, can make hard to achieve, even though you might think at first glance that all of this is just really increasing representation, um, like so, sort of. <laughs> um, and um, yeah, I mean, our group was recently able to get funding with some of the other groups here um, by saying that we're going to sort of study big team science and um, produce some of this infrastructure that might help big team science do better. Um, but we haven't actually gotten funding to do the big team science, <laughs> um, more like to uh, learn about big team science. So um, despite, you know, a huge number of unsuccessful grant applications. So yeah, it's, it's tough. All right, um, last question before we move to the Q&A. Um, so if uh, uh, we've been talking about challenges a bit, um, what shifts or changes would you like to see from funders or universities or uh, other stakeholders to help make big team science more sustainable? Um, so uh, you touched on this already, Kylie, so I'll um, hand the floor to you before going to other people. So I don't know how others have, you know, we often get um, funders seem interested, they seem really interested because they're interested in replicable results, they're interested in finding out true things, um, but they're not so interested in funding the replications. Um, they're more interested in funding like the really exciting stuff that you know tends to happen in individual labs. Um, and so we always end up sort of getting quite far and then like ultimately getting rejected. Um, so yeah, I, I think that one of the things that we've tried to do is, is talk to universities themselves um, as a like, maybe universities could have a sort of big team science um, thing where universities have pots of money going toward these kinds of projects. We've had, you know, relatively little uptake, um, but uh, I wonder if that's a potential um, wave of the future um, because we find that like the federal agencies um, are less are less open to it than you might hope. What about you, Lauren? Yeah, Kelly, I think that's a really interesting question about using the universities as a source. We've been able to do that, and I shouldn't say me personally, but the group. Um, so we've never actually very infrequently have we had the science funded. It's mostly often sort of the coordination, which is good, right? Because that's what really makes it all function in, in our case. But, you know, big funders have only taken that so far because there's this idea that like, well, if you can do this on a shoestring budget, why do you need money for us? Look what you've done with no money so far. And so, which, right, we all understand where that's frustrating, but um, we have switched to an approach where we try to sort of approach universities or organizations that have funding for sort of institutes. Like for example, at the University of Minnesota, they've gotten some money from the Institute on the Environment because they like to host the Nutrient Network, right? It's a big deal for them to be able to say like, you know, we've got 60 papers and we're getting, you know, it's like 10 papers a year and it's looking really great. And so perhaps some sort of institutional funding like that could work well for you because it's worked pretty well for us. How about you, Nick? This is, this is really interesting. Um, you know, we, we've also considered the institution funding issue quite a bit, but one of our concerns is that um, by, by seeking funding through institutions, we've essentially centralized the power of the network. Um, and, you know, you know, ideally we, we, we want there to be a director in a different region every, you know, every five years. Um, and so that's sort of our concern is that we, we limit ourselves a bit and particularly in the US, it's very hard to hire someone who doesn't live in the US. And so um, in order for us to like be diverse um, and financially sustainable, we would have to keep recruiting people into the US to fill important roles. So that's one of the concerns we've had with that, with that approach. Um, although I, I will say we're, we're certain, you know, I think that many of us have certainly considered it nevertheless. Um, I wanted to make a quick note about, you know, particularly federal funders priority um, or preference rather for, you know, 
the, the exciting science that's happening in a single lab as opposed to um, this big team science, which I view as equally exciting. Um, but we often, when we're asking for money, we're asking for money to build infrastructure um, because we think that that's sort of the you know, essential thing that we need to continue doing the science that we do. Um, and those, those infrastructure grants are extremely challenging to get. Um, and I've been a little surprised about how challenging it is and, and surprised that funders aren't seeing the value in it because the infrastructure that we've developed, for instance, in Psychological Science Accelerator has been uh, has had an enormous impact on the field so far. And uh, people have taken, you know, our data sets and published papers off of reanalyses of our data sets because they're so well documented and so well centralized. People have taken our policy documents and adopted them to other uh, emerging big team science organizations as a way of modeling um, their group. People have taken our project management sheets and um, our, you know, our protocols and used it to conduct other large scale replications outside of the, our organization. And so when I think about the Psychological Science Accelerator, I think that we do a lot of really amazing science, but I actually think that the infrastructure and policies that we develop are our most impactful export. Um, and so that's why it's extremely frustrating that that's the exact thing that we have so much difficulty funding. Drew, what about you? Yeah, so I'm going to make a brief case for, um, for kind of local funding involvement. So because as I mentioned, our, our tasks are very simple. Um, they need to be flexible. Um, so all oftentimes uh, the people we get who uh, want to spend some time working with the animals and want to just get involved are undergraduates, uh, research assistants, and master's students. So they become involved through their curriculums. And so that connects us back to um, the institutions and the actual learning curriculums at the institutions. And so um, at that level, we'd like, like there's certainly potential for us to link, particularly where there are zoos, to link the zoos more closely with like the institutional curriculums and the universities. Um, to make create a more seamless bridge because there certainly aren't that many bridges at the moment and we great to create a more bridges between uh, zoos and other uh, sanctuaries uh, and the universities and the people and the students who want to work with the animals at these sites. Great and uh, Tim do you want to wrap us up? Sure yeah thanks I mean I, people have you know I think made a lot of good points. I, I, I want to comment briefly on the on the idea of this idea that I guess Drew was just ending with too, which is just this institutional funding, kind of local institutional funding. And certainly, so for instance, as a contributor to, to Dragnet, um, I'm funding the work, you know, that work through local in my local institutional funding. Like, and it's great. And it work and and you know, th and that works. And I I don't want to, I don't want to criticize it because I think often it's really kind of the only option. Um, but uh, but I, I, I do, I guess, want to make the point, you know, I, I want to echo a point that was made earlier about, you know, trying to promote, um, uh, you know, contributions from a more diverse array of places. And there's so, um, you know, Kylie mentioned uh, weird, which so I mean, I'm not a social scientist, but I know that that's a social scientist acronym for I don't know, white European, I don't know what it is. I don't remember what it stands for, but anyway, like, you know, a, a, a biased subset of, of humanity that a lot of research comes out of. Um, the same thing happens uh, in ecology as well. Um, and certainly like there's a lot of research coming out of places like Europe and North America and Australia um, and, uh, and, and NutNet. And I, I actually have, don't know what the map of Dragnet participation looks like, but, but NutNet, Hat was global, but it was definitely skewed towards um, towards North America and um, and and Europe, et cetera. And if we're relying on people to just have that institutional funding, obviously, when if we're hoping that to get contributors from places that fundamentally have less fewer resources, it's going to be harder for those people to have institutional funding sufficient to do to do the work. So. Although I don't want to sound, I don't want to be critical of using local institutional funding because I think that it, I, in in, a, in the current environment, it's kind of essential. I think, um, I think it also does limit the uh, the breadth of, of of participants and systems that we can include. All right, um, I'm going to switch over to the Q and A. I I can see a variety of questions, and if more come up, uh, please do ask them in the Q and A box. 
we'll just keep going until uh, we're at the end of our time. Um, so I'll, I'll uh, ask the first one to the group, um, do, do any of your department heads or re research institutes have a mechanism to consider uh, big team science style work in hiring, promotion, or tenure? Uh, so uh, let's start maybe with, uh, with Lauren. Shoot, I was, can you rephrase that? Or can you just say that again? I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, do uh, any of the relevant um, people who give, who uh, control career advancements have uh, a way to consider big team style science, big team science style work in hiring, promotion, tenure, any of those uh, big gotcha. milestones? Um, I'm definitely probably not the person to ask because I hope they do, but... Um... Again, I think what it just takes for me at least is a lot of information, providing information for people about why it's so important. And so there's nothing specifically about that for me at all, but I do work really hard or other people I've heard of the network, but I work really hard to explain to them why it's so important. Great. Um... This is this is a tough one, I think, because uh, it's open 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 question. Um, but uh, Nick, how about you? Um, I'm I'm not I'm not really aware because I haven't asked for a promotion. <laughs> um, I haven't even dared to ask for a promotion. Um, but I, I will say I've I've heard from other members of the network um, that they've had you know some some frustration. Uh, with this exact issue where um, they're applying for funding or they're applying for promotion and um, they've been deemed um, for being too much of a supporting scientist and not enough of a lead scientist and th those um those 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 hit really really hard um, because you know we're all doing this because we we saw that science was being done in a way that was inadequate and we all you know, poured our heart, soul, and energy into trying to build a bigger and better science. Um, and it seems that maybe uh, the people who make hiring and promotion and funding decisions haven't uh, quite caught up to our thinking on this yet. All right. Um, next question. Um, do you do you all have any mechanisms in place to uh, avoid groupthink or um, too similar of uh, of decisions? Uh, let's uh, let's go to Tim. Maybe I think I'll pass on this one. I'm not, I'm not sure it's super relevant to. I mean, in the sense that we're not one of these democratic pro, uh, um, sort of organizations with lots of people. It's very, we're very centralized anyway. So anyway, I don't feel like this question, maybe I'm missing it, but I don't feel like it's relevant particularly to myself. Yeah, the, so the, the question is, um, are there any mechanisms to avoid too much uh, similarity in decisions or groupthink? Um, do you have any structured ways to promote um, different types of opinions? No, I mean, I, I get the, I get the, I don't know if you're direct, redirecting the question to me. I understand the question. I just don't think it's that, yeah. I don't, I'm not sure it's that applicable to my situation. But. I'll chime in because um, for the audience members, uh, Patrick repeated it because I missed the question. <laughs> so sorry, sorry, Tim. Um, uh, I, I will say that I, I suspect that we could be doing a better job at that. And when I saw that question, I wanted to immediately jump on it because I said, oh, may, maybe we should be doing better there. Um, I will say that we, um, in, in some projects not done with our network, but by members of our network, um, we have, ex you know, intentionally explored adversarial models of collaboration where we intentionally seek out people um, who we know disagree on this topic. Um, within the Psychological Science Accelerator, we also have um, tried what we call the red team approach recently, where we have a study proposal and we sen send it to people who we think are very critical and will hate it. Um, and then they tell us, that they hate it and we try to make it so that they don't hate it as much. Um, and we've had, I think, some success with that so far. Um, we've learned that, that that process hasn't ever given us a perfect study yet, but I think that it's led us to have studies that are much better than we would have had if we didn't engage in that sort of intentional uh, seeking out of critiques. Great. Um, next question. Uh... Let's let's assume that uh, your organization gets 
very substantial funding. Um, so, uh, you know, at the National Institutes of Health in the United States gives you an enormous grant. Um, what would be your top priority uh, for uh, how you use that money in your organization? Kylie? Well, first, I want to say I don't think that is a risk um, that any of us are likely to encounter uh, anytime soon or ever. But um, I do think that what we routine, the reason we routinely apply for grants are for two reasons. One is um, to get money to pay people to do the things that are otherwise our graduate students on up are doing for free and don't really have time to be doing. Um, so like data management and infrastructure building and all of the sort of work that ends up, you know, if we could have fixed these problems in the beginning, um, they would save a lot of work overall. So I would say like people power would be a huge one. Um, and then um, the other thing would be um, actually increasing diversity. Um, in ways that are that are sustainable and um, that might actually promote, you know, labs being able to participate long term um, as opposed to a one-off kind of participation, things like that. Great. Um, so, uh, oh, uh, how about Drew next? Sure. Yeah. So I mean, if we had if we had enough money to do this, I mean, for us, we we're going to need to take the step into developing our infrastructure, and our sustainability uh, pretty soon, I think. And like for us, I think getting someone who can coordinate and uh, communicate in the range nations, maybe even multiple range continents, particularly like, well, ideally someone who's actually based there, like someone who knows and is fluent in Spanish in South, in South America, for instance, who can then coordinate and communicate, integrate with people who are working there. Those are the kinds of things that we need to really kind of make sure our operation is sustainable and also grow it in a, in a diverse way. Kyla? Sorry, I hadn't lowered my hand from before. I'm, I'm... Okay, um, great. So uh, next question. Oh, I, I see Lauren wants to say something. Go ahead. I, I just wanted to make one quick comment that I'm like really happy to hear that everyone, because you know, Kylie, those were my two thoughts as well of how I spend my money. And I just think it's really great that we're really trying to figure out how to make these networks that are supposed to be inclusive, right? The whole point of these networks is to like be as inclusive as we can, but yet we're very, definitely failing in many ways. And so I'm glad to see that that's where we want to go. I just wanted to point out that I think that's really great. Nick, go ahead. I think those are all, you know, extremely important uses of funding. And I think it just underscores how badly we need funding because there are so many things that we need to use this funding for. Um, I don't know what I would use it for first, but I know that high on my priority list would be infrastructure. Um, because I, I think that, you know, this big team science model is the best model we have so far for producing valid and reliable knowledge, at least in psychology, that's been my experience. And um, my, my hope is that we can help other people do this. I, I don't want to control every single big team science project that happens in social and cognitive psychology. Um, because it would take up more hours than, than I think we have. Um, but to be able to hand someone uh, a program and say, hey, if you need to have 500 people submit a consent form and know that they submitted it um, and also upload their authorship information and also do this, this, and this, if I could give people that infrastructure and say, now go and do big team science, that would be incredibly valuable, especially if I can make that software openly available, which is you know, everything that the psychological science accelerator does is based on principles of openness. Um, and I think that would be useful, not just for scientists, but other fields where they're trying to coordinate really large and complex things. Um, and so uh, this doesn't by any mean diminish the importance of the other things that we would spend funding on, but it's just one that I've, you know, sort of thought a lot about and looked at, you know, looked into, uh, the future instead of, gosh, I hope we can get funding for this one day. Tim, uh, did you have something that you want to add? 
Well, I was gonna, I, I put my hand up because I was gonna ask Nick for an example of infrastructure and then he gave one. So I'm happy, thanks. Great. Um, well, so I'll, I'll ask the next question then. Um, so when we were talking about, um, you know, what uh, approaches to big team science, uh, we, a lot of you talked about having a common protocol, um, but there's a, a question here on that asks about sort of a different approach to big team science, which is adding in systematic sources of uh, differences across protocols or systematic heterogeneity. Um, so do any of you have uh, thoughts about that alternative uh, approach to big team science? And um, do you have any examples that you could talk about? Uh, Nick, why don't you go ahead? Sorry, Patrick, I missed that question because I was responding to um, a question from Warren. Can you read Yeah, the question is about systematic differences uh, uh, between protocols. Oh, that's the question that I really hoped we'd have time to answer. Yeah, I think that's a really great use of big team science resources. Um, one of the things that we've learned in the Psychological Science Accelerator is that there's all of these changes that you can make to a study that drastically change your conclusion. So the, the area that you sample your participants in, the models that you run. And when we first were tackling these issues, we thought that we were tackling them in isolation. And then we realized that they're actually multiplicative. And we would say, oh, but this, th these three data analysis strategies yield the same answer when we run our analyses on US participants, but they don't yield the same answer when we run our analyses on participants in Africa. Um, and so what we're realizing is that all of these, these things that can change your study are multiplicative. The methods, the measures, the participants, they all interact in order to change the result that you actually obtain. Um, and so this is something that um, we're just starting to explore, I think, um, in studies with the Psychological Science Accelerator. And it's one of the um, priorities that I'm hoping to convince the network to have is to systematically uh, spend our resources, not just doing super clean direct replications everywhere, but in intentionally introducing these sources of heterogeneity. Um, because in order to, to run a study like that, you need a lot of participants, a lot of data. Um, that's what we're really good at. We're really good at getting a lot of data to answer those, those questions. We're um, heading up uh, on the last bits of our time. So uh, I think for the, the last few minutes, um, I'll give uh, anyone who wants a chance to give some closing thoughts on big team science, the, the future of big team science, um, challenges to it uh, anywhere you want to take it. So closing thoughts. And um, maybe we could go to Lauren. Sure. Um, I guess my closing thoughts are that I've learned an awful lot from talking to folks outside of ecology on what big team science looks like. And I really appreciate that. So I think that these kind of efforts uh, can really help us see, think, be, you know, think about problems we didn't, or solutions that we didn't even know we could come up with, with just within our field. So I, I have really appreciated that for these, yeah. Uh, Kylie, go ahead. Um, well, while I have the opportunity, um, and given that it seemed like we're all really talking about the same kinds of challenges, I do want to plug this um, potentially long-term funding line that we've recently gotten about sort of studying big team science um, and solving problems for big team science um, out of the Social Sciences and Humanities um, uh, Research Council in Canada. Um, and we're adding... We, it's called a partnership grant, and the idea is that we will add partners as we go. Some of um, the people on this panel are already partners, but um, there's another um, application coming up in a couple of years that is potentially a lot of money where we could have a lot more partners. So if anyone who's in the audience or on the panel would potentially like to participate in such a thing, um, please get in touch with me. Um, I, Again, I'm Kylie Hamlin at UBC, um, and we can um, potentially talk more. Yeah, Tim, go ahead. I just want to unmute myself. Um, I just want to say that uh, I mean it's it's great to for us to get together, and and I found this to be really valuable, and it's it's just nice to hear 
um, all uh, you know th these various things that big team science, these 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 collaborative efforts have done in the various ways they're productive. I mean, I was already convinced of the value of this beforehand, but you know, hearing stuff today um, uh, has has further convinced me. Um, but it does seem to me that the, the biggest challenge is going to be convincing institutions, institutions like funders, et cetera, in the value of this really deeply collaborative work. I think the, the structure of science right now is very focused on like the PI, like the person, the person who's doing it all. And, you know, I think in some disciplines, like in physics with things like particle accelerators and stuff, which obviously I think you guys are playing off of with the psych science accelerator, you know, there's recognition that you know a lot of the really important stuff can only be answered with really deeply collaborative um, and broadly collaborative efforts. And I, I hope that recognition spreads beyond physics. Wonderful, thanks, Tim. Uh, that's all our time. So um, thanks so much to all the panelists. Uh, thanks for everybody for your, um, for your close attention. I thought this was a great session. So uh, thanks everyone and have a great conference. Thanks, Patrick. Great, thanks so much.